Well, welcome everyone. My name is Madonna Marion Landes, and I serve as the Associate Dean for External Relations at the Villanova School of Business. Before I introduce our guest speaker, I'd like to thank Vince Nicastro, Director of Villanova Athletics, Bob Blanchard and Dr. Brian Crable from the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, and along with VSB, who are co-sponsoring this event. I'd also like to recognize and thank Dim, D, uh, Jim DiLorenzo, over here to my left, who is a 1984 Villanova alumnus who served as Assistant Sports Information Director at Villanova from 1984 to 1990, and subsequently Sports Information Director from 1990 to 1995. Jim now represents our guest speaker through his own public relations firm and has made our guest speaker's visit possible today. This Saturday, I'm sure this is no surprise to anyone here, ESPN will be coming to Villanova for College Game Day for the very first time in Villanova basketball history. When Jay Wright learned of ESPN's decision, he commented, we're thrilled that ESPN has decided to bring College Game Day to the Villanova campus for the first time. The entire country will get to see the great support we receive from Nova Nation and our amazing student section. All of us at Villanova are excited about this opportunity. How timely that our guest speaker, Bill Rasmussen, the man who had the dream and founded ESPN, is here with us today. On September 7, 1979, a year before many of you, probably most of you, weren't even born, <coughs> ESPN went on the air for the very first time. Entrepreneurial daring, irrepressible enthusiasm, and a dash of good luck gave the world the first 24-hour television network. Once unleashed upon sports fans, ESPN's impact forever changed the way we watch television. A lifelong entrepreneur and sports fan, Bill Rasmussen's innovations in advertising, sports, and broadcasting are numerous and include the creation of Sports Center, wall-to-wall -wall coverage of NCAA, NCAA regular season and March Madness college basketball, and coverage of the NFL draft. He broke the advertising barrier to cable television by signing Anheuser-Busch to the largest cable TV advertising contract ever. Bill has been named the father of cable sports by USA Today, and he was named to the Sports 100, which honored the 100 most important people in American sports history. His place in sports history has also been recognized by Sports Illustrated, where he was honored as one of the 40 individuals who has significantly altered and elevated the world of sports. <coughs> a, US Air, a U.S. Air Force veteran, Bill received his bachelor's degree in economics from DePaul University and his MBA from Rutgers University. Bill is in the Philadelphia area this week uh, promoting his new book called Sports Junkies Rejoice, The Birth of ESPN, <coughs> where he gives an inside account of how ESPN came to be. And we are pleased that he has carved out some time to spend with us today. Without further ado, let's give a warm Nova Nation welcome to innovator and entrepreneur Bill Rasmussen. and I am delighted to be here today and thank all of you for coming. I, am I causing anybody to miss a class by any chance? Not, you don't have to put, don't identify yourself. Whatever you do, don't identify yourself. I want to echo Madonna's uh, comments about Jim DiLorenzo. Uh, I met Jim about just short of three years ago and we have developed a strong working relationship. And I have to tell you, every other word out of his mouth is Villanova this and Villanova. And I kept saying, when are you going to take me to Villanova? Well, he finally delivered, so here we are. I, uh, looking back, I was uh, sitting where you were sitting, many, I won't tell you how many, but a lot of years ago, uh, harboring and thinking about and dreaming about probably a lot of the same things that you are. What am I going to do when I finish at Villanova? Where am I going to go? How is life going to treat me? What are the great ideas? My time uh, when I 
first began to think about all of these things that ultimately led me to do what I'm doing, uh, I lived in Chicago, and the two baseball teams in Chicago, which shall remain nameless since the Phillies are going to win the World Series again this year, obviously, right? <laughs> all right. Not miss. Not miss. Best pitching staff in baseball maybe ever since the 1954 Cleveland Indians. Look at all the blank looks. <laughs> because, you're, because you're all a little bit younger than I am. Just for the record, though, that 1954 uh, staff of the Cleveland Indians, top five pitchers, won 93 games. So there's something you can, you can watch Lee Halliday, Ellis Walden, coming in, Hamels and company do this year. They, they could get there. But you know, thinking about that, that's, all of them have to be pretty close to 20-game winners. But besides that, I went to this uh, group. And one of the Chicago, both the Chicago baseball announcers were there. And they talked about doing anything you want to do. This was a group, not unlike all of you today. You all have, as I mentioned a minute ago, dreams. What, where are you going to go? You're learning things. You're training your mind. You have your personal interests and so on. What am I going to do with it? And I, what this fellow said that day, I have never forgotten. You can do anything you put your mind to. We have an opportunity in this country to do just that. When I was growing up, everyone told us, by the time you're 35, now 35 might sound like a long way off to some of you, but it isn't. You'll be there real quick. <laughs> by the time you're 35, if you haven't settled in to your career path, you're probably not going to be worth very much as you go through the rest of your life. What a discouraging thing to say. Wouldn't you agree? <laughs> to set the record straight, I was fired from my job as the New England Whalers communications director and, and broadcaster uh, Memorial Day weekend 1978. And the idea of ESPN came and at that time I was way past that 35 mark and by the time ESPN <coughs> went on the air I was at the 47 year old mark. So you see there is hope after 35 and as you put things together, whatever you think about don't be discouraged no matter what happens if somebody fires you, if somebody says you can't do this, tell them you can. And sometimes getting fired is a really kind of a cathartic experience. You get rid of all the bad things, you get rid of all the patterns and the habits that you've fallen into, and then you can say, okay, now I'm really gonna get down to business. And it, it helps if, uh, as I was, I was married and had three kids who uh, liked to be fed. That's a great incentive as well. <laughs> that really is a great incentive. But uh, I mentioned I was fired on Memorial Day weekend, June 1st, roughly, 1978. And by the following March 1st, just about nine months, all of the elements that made ESPN happen had fallen into place. We had customers, we had programming, we had the satellite, we had financing, and we had our first big advertiser, as Madonna mentioned. Anheuser-Busch was the biggest sports advertiser then and probably still is today. And here we were months before we went on the air. You have to keep in mind, we didn't go on the air until September 7th, 1979. <coughs> but in that one nine-month period, roughly June through March, June 78 through March 79, all of those elements fell into place, and we thought that it was the natural progression of events. <clears throat> Since then, I have been startled by how many people have said, you mean all those people did that before you ever even went on the air? <coughs> yeah. Well, how did you do that? You know what? I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. We had enthusiasm. We had perseverance. We had everybody that worked just knew it was going to, to happen. Um, when I say knew it was going to happen, Madonna mentioned that all of you are maybe not of the era that remembers any TV at all before ESPN. Does anybody, anybody in the room remember the old black and white television days and all of those kinds of things? <laughs> Nobody's going to admit it in front of all of you young people, I can tell you that. <laughs> In 1978 and 79, there were really only 12, every TV set came with just 12 channels. That's all there were. No cable TV. Cable TV was a very tiny uh, blip on the business world of television. There were maybe 12, 12 and a half million households 
that had cable TV, and it started in 1952 and obviously wasn't growing very fast. But the big three networks got a little lazy, and if there's a, me uh, if there's a message as you go into your chosen profession, whatever it may be, if the people ahead of you are getting lazy or stop, stop being innovative or stop thinking about their job every day, that's another opportunity for you. One of the things that I say to business people, I've had the good fortune to speak to some groups, is even if you're in a corporate situation, you have to be entrepreneurial every day. You have to <coughs> walk into work, how can I do better today what I was doing tomorrow? How will I do it better of doing yesterday and how will I do it better tomorrow? Because as soon as you stand still, somebody's going to go past you. And <coughs> I stand here today as a living example of that because of what ESPN did to the big, big three networks. When we started talking about a 24-hour sports network, can you imagine what a silly idea was that was? Who's going to watch sports 24 hours a day, they said. Well, nobody's going to watch sports 24 hours a day. They missed the point. And the networks were, were using that, and they're saying, who's going to watch sports 24 hours a day? Well, if they had looked at themselves, nobody watched ABC, NBC, or CBS 24 hours a day. Well, first of all, they were only on 18 hours a day then. It's hard for me to believe, when I look back at it, ESPN was the first, not only 24-hour sports network, but the first 24-hour television network in the United States. There was no Fox. No CNN, no Weather Channel, no MTV. All of those came after ESPN. And the big three networks, in their infinite, I hate to say the word wisdom because that doesn't seem appropriate, but in their infinite position on where we were, basically said, we know better than they do. They're not going to succeed. We're not going to change. Now, if you look back and you think about that, that was a pretty dumb decision on their part. Because if they had moved quickly, we were all little guys scrabbling around. We started ESPN. I hate to say this in front of business students because this is not a very good way to start a business. But we took a credit card cash advance of nine thousand dollars. <laughs> not exactly recommended, you know, business plan and all. We didn't have that. Uh, <laughs> investors, we didn't have those either. But we had a credit card that was good for nine thousand dollars, so we could start the idea. <laughs> And there's a tie right here in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania, that entered into that as we took that credit card advance and moved through. We engaged a small investment firm out here in King of Prussia, and they actually brought us to Getty Oil, which turned out to be the gusher of cash uh, back in those days that made it all possible. But getting back to those networks, those guys didn't like us very much. And there are some ironies that came out of that. ABC, NBC, and CBS Sports were doing about three to four hundred hours each, maybe thirteen hundred hours total sports every year. And uh, we were telling them, we're going to do 8,760 hours. We're going to go 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And they said, you can't do that. Nobody's going to do that. We're the only people who know how to do sports. So <coughs> anyway. And the irony is, the most vocal network sports president was the NBC sports president. In April of 1979, April, now we went on the air in September, in April, he was still bad-mouthing us rather loudly, and then he found out his contract with NBC wasn't going to be renewed, and guess who became an ESPN officer before we went on the air September 7th? Now, he had to do a lot of backtracking, and one of the things he had to learn was that we don't have limousines pick you up every morning and take you to work. We don't have an executive dining room on the top of the NBC 30 Rock. We don't have all of those things. And everybody works all day, every day, weekends, and nobody has any concern for <coughs> time clocks. And he also had to learn, as we, as we kidded him, the lingo of cable television about subscribers and MSOs and all of those kinds of things. And he wondered how much we had to pay all of these cable systems to carry our sports channels. Wow, who, wanted, who wants to pay anybody anything? We've got such a great idea. We're going to have them pay us. Because after all, isn't that what cable, vision, uh, cable television is about? Do any of you have to pay cable television bills and your families and so on? And then DirecTV and all that that came later. Well, anyway, he, um, he started and talked about 
the um, need to pay affiliates to take us, and we talked them out of that. And we started collecting subscriber fees. We collected, and this is going to sound like a real tiny number, 2.4 cents per subscriber per month. Doesn't sound like a lot of money, does it? 2.4 cents per subscriber. And we had about 1.4 million subscribers when we went on the year. And they were always making deals and they wanted to get a free month and all that sort of stuff. Eventually that went from 2.4 to a nickel to a dime and on up. And then we hit a barrier of a dollar and oh my goodness gracious, what's going to happen? Nobody's going to buy this. Well, cut through all of that. Today, we started with 1.4 million subscribers. Today, just this month, the ESPN passed the 100 million households in the U.S. And every <coughs> month, each of those 100 million households pays to ESPN $4.08. 100 million subscribers times $4.08 per month per subscriber. So when you wonder about how they get the fees to pay the NFL, or to do Monday Night Football, to do the ACLS, or whatever it might be, <coughs> You're all helping them pay for it, and me too, and everybody in the room, and 100 million households across the country. I want to tell you some things about how we got there, but while I'm talking about numbers, these new numbers that just came out from ESPN, they now have 350 additional households all around the world. 100 million in the U.S., 350 million more around the world, in over 200 countries, delivered in 16 languages on all seven continents. It is just literally everywhere and it all grew from an idea that just came in a uh, traffic jam on a road in Connecticut back in 1978 when we were working off that $9,000 cash advance and people ask me frequently how did it happen and I, I, as I said earlier I, I still look back and wonder how it happened and if you think about suppose we hadn't answered a phone call or suppose we hadn't done had made a phone call, which is an interesting way. If you think about marketing, I'm sure marketing is on everyone's mind and it's easy today. As a matter of fact, as, we're, as I'm standing here today and looking at all of you, and I don't know any of you except a few over here on my left, uh, any one of you and I could have an idea, and in 10 minutes from now we could have, we'd have our URL called GoDaddy or somebody, we could have it and we could sketch out something and, we, and we'd announce our idea to the world. Is that pretty reasonable? It could happen that fast, right? How do you think we marketed ESPN? Didn't have computers, didn't have faxes, didn't have email, didn't have internet, didn't have any of those kinds of things. And sometimes I'm asked, and a lot of people, depending on where they are in the, uh, in the age range, talk about how did you do that? Did, was it all faxes or did you just email everybody or whatever? Not realizing that's how new everything is. And there have been new technologies since some of you started here at Villanova have come on the scene. We had to do it the old-fashioned way. We had to pick up the phone and call somebody. We had to get on a plane or a car and go see them. Or we had to put stamps on an envelope and mail press releases. Can you imagine that? <laughs> mail like the old-fashioned U.S. Post Office. And who did we mail them to? Well, we didn't have a way to go to Google and find out who was interested. <coughs> What we had to do was we got these big, thick directories, and people would sit down and go through and pick out the names of sports directors or television <coughs> reviewers or whatever it might be, and we would generate these press releases. Well, that was really exciting, and we kept mailing these press releases and mailing these press releases and mailing them, and nobody called. So we decided we must be doing something wrong. Well, our printer came up with a great idea, and he said, the problem is they don't know who it's coming from, and they don't because we, you know, we just had ESPN and typical uh, return on the upper left-hand corner of the envelope. So he created, you probably have seen those four letters, right? ESPN. And he created something that looked like that. It was a pre they've only had two logos. This is the newest one. The prior logo had a little circle around, a little ellipse around it. And he said, we're gonna print them about this big in the upper left-hand corner of a number 10 envelope in bright red and start mailing it. <coughs> didn't have a return address, didn't have anything. We figured if they wanted to find out who it was, they'd have to open the, open the envelope and see what was inside. 
when I was doing sports broadcasting, if we got a letter that was more, I mean, a press release that was more than one page long, we threw it in the wastebasket. So all of our press releases were one page, big letters, learn about ESPN, this is what we're going to do, we're telling you we're going to revolutionize the world. All of a sudden the phone started ringing. So you never know, trial and error, whatever it might be, just get after it and, and see what happens. What happened was the most amazing company in media history was born and now Sports Center is the longest running television show. More episodes of Sports Center have been aired than any other show in television history. And it's seen around the world and it competes with Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola as the most recognized brand in the world. I don't know what happened to McDonald's. They must be going south on us here. <laughs> but to get, get back to the, the way that this unfolded was, uh, was rather miraculous. We got fired. We, uh, I was supposed to go talk about the, Hart uh, the Hartford Whalers on a TV show the following Tuesday after Memorial Day weekend. And I called the guy and said, you know, you probably don't want to talk to me about the Whalers. They just fired me. <coughs> so he said, let's talk anyway. And we thought we'd have a great idea, something, we'd come up with something for the state of Connecticut and the cable systems in the state of Connecticut. Now, I don't know how many of you are familiar. You heard me say now there are 100 million cable television homes in the United States. In 1978, in the state of Connecticut, there were 10 franchises, and only five were active. And the largest one had 9,500 <coughs> subscribers. We could have charged $4.08 back then, and we still wouldn't have made any money with that small a base. But what we did have was some cable people who were interested enough to help us learn about the cable industry, which, which always reminds me that no matter what you learn, in a classroom, a business school, communication school, whatever it might be, you will never know everything about everything. Never be afraid to say, I don't know, I'm going to go ask somebody. So we said, we don't know. We don't know anything about this satellite business. Well, it turns out these five cable operators were active, and the five that weren't all came together in a meeting. And our host said, uh, Bill wants to talk about some television, and he's got some ideas about sports that we think are pretty exciting. Can we help him out? Can we tell him, what do we know about cable? One guy raised his hand, he said, well, you can buy all of New England for something. And the guy on the other side said, no, you can't do that. You buy everything east of the Mississippi. And another one said, no, you buy weekends. And another one said, no, you buy weekdays, you know. Kind of crazy. Finally, one guy said, got a great idea pick up the phone and call RCA, because they do really know what they're talking about. It's their satellite. Now, can you imagine? I'm a little guy from the south side of Chicago. I just got fired from my job, and I'm going to call one of the largest corporations in the world, and they're going to pick up the phone and say, oh, hi, Bill. How's everything today, right? Guess what? They did. I didn't know, and this is one of those things when you don't know something, some good things happen. I didn't know RCA had launched a satellite and could not give transponders, which is the channel, couldn't give them away. Each satellite that goes up has 24 transponders. For, they shot up uh, SATCOM-1, launched it. The military took 12 of the channels. The other 12, they were trying to sell to people, it turned out. HBO bought five hours a night. Somebody else bought two hours in the afternoon. And they counted that as a sole transponder. But essentially, they had all of their transponders empty. So I miraculously got through to the uh, satellite communication sales group. A fellow answered the phone and said, where are you calling from? I said, wow, why? He said, I'll be up there tomorrow morning. I didn't know at that point they couldn't give them away. So he came up and he said, you can buy this for $1,250 a night, five hours. <coughs> oh, we want something else. So we went through this whole thing, and at the end of the day, he said, we have another item on the tariff. We've been trying for three years to get somebody interested, and nobody has even talked about it, so we took it off the tariff. It's 24 hours a day, five years, for $34,167 a month. My son, uh, who some of you may have seen some of his work, Rasmussen reports, he's the the pollster that does that, and he's pretty quick with numbers, and he said, that can't be right. 
He said, what do you mean it can't be right? He said, I, I just read it to you. And he said, well, that's $1,143 a day for all 24 hours, and you told me it's $1,250 for five hours at night. Well, he said, that's the tariff. That's, you know, well, we said, thank you very much. We didn't, didn't really know what we were talking about. I'll tell you how bad this was? And if I asked you quick, you might, any, some of you, if I asked you point blank, you might have the same problem. Are the two T's in satellite and two L's, or one T and one L and two, and where are they coming in? I couldn't even spell satellite, and I didn't know what a transponder was. <laughs> so the next morning, we called RCA Bank and said, we'll take one of those things. <laughs> we couldn't tell them what it was because we didn't know what it was. <laughs> so he said, one of what things? We said, one of those 24-hour things you told us cost $34,167. His answer was, you will? <laughs> you will? He was startled. And so we got that. Now, from a business point of view, the thought may have occurred to some of you, let's see, you said $9,000 credit card cash advance, and this is $34,167 a month. How are you going to pay for that, right? We didn't know. <laughs> but RCA was having, as I mentioned, problems getting customers. And so we'll make a deal. We won't send you a bill until 90 days after the first use. Okay? Keep that 90 days in mind. And then we have 30 days to pay the bill. Now this is, now we're into August and we're starting to think about doing some uh, demonstration programming for the cable industry. We're going to send some things over the satellite just so they can, you know, we publish it or promote it so they could get an idea. And we were going to do a game in November, a basketball game at night, and a soccer game the following morning at the University of Connecticut. So he said, November, let's see, that means we've got December, January, February, we're going to have to pay at the end of March. We have come up with a better solution. So we called USA Network, which back then was called Madison Square Garden Sports, and they weren't using their, they had a transponder, but they weren't using it very often, a few hours here and there. So we said, we'd like to buy a few hours on this Friday night and a Saturday morning. Can you handle it? Can you help us? And they said, sure, no problem. We all worked together because nobody knew what was happening in cable. And so we said, send us a bill. How much is it going to be? And they said, $200. Whew, 200 we could still handle in that $9,000 cash advance, right? We had that made. So then we showed them, and we got a lot of interest from those games. And finally, we decided we better do one on our own. And on January 9th, uh, I think it was the 9th of 1979, we did a Rutgers at Connecticut basketball game on our own transponder January 9th. So now we've got February, March, April, they're going to send us the bill, so now we don't have to pay till May. Well, we just, you know, this is kind of like pushing off on the credit card, right? You just keep pushing it farther down the line. So, so in the meantime, we were talking to Gary <coughs> Oil, who decided to consider us as a possible investment. We were talking to the NCAA about getting programming, and there's a fun story about that that I'll tell you about pushing money down the line. But the long story short, to end the payment of the satellite, Getty Oil agreed to finance us on February 14th, and so we had three full months before our first payment was due, and by then, Getty was paying all the bills. So we literally launched ESPN, got the satellite, got programming to put on the satellite, and got an investor and never paid a penny toward the satellite. Which when I look back now, when I said earlier, I don't know how some things work, that one really baffles me. But we got through it, and as they say, the rest is, is history. Getting to the NCAA and getting programming was an interesting story. <coughs> the NCAA had been formed in 1949, and all of the all of the decisions basically had made, been made by one gentleman, Walter Byers, was the executive director who ruled with an iron fist. I'm sure Jim and others here who re remember those days of the Byers uh, era would, would uh, attest to that. But anyway, we were kept going to Kansas City, where their offices were, just outside suburban Kansas City, trying to get to talk to Walter Byers. And you always had to talk to somebody else. You could meet his secretary, but she'd take you to Tom Hansen, or to Dennis Ryder, or to somebody. And then we had to work with the TV committee, and we had to go through the, the chairman to get it on the agenda at a TV committee meeting. 
we finally did that, and we'd fly to the Kansas City airport, and there was an airport Marriott right next door, and all the people would fly in from all over the country. We'd have the meeting, and they say, that's very nice, Bill. Thank you very much. We'll get back to you. Call us again. And, and, well, we kept doing all of these things. And finally, somebody, one of them said, you know, you really ought to just send a letter to all of these coaches. And we met some legendary coaches and athletic directors, Daryl Royal from Tennessee was there, and Eddie Crowder, names that you wouldn't know, but if you look in the annals of sports history, they're big names. They, they were big names. And I remember, there's only one response I remember getting, and I thought, well, okay, I'll put all, all these packages together. There are only a dozen members on the committee, and I sent them all off. And they said, and then after, this was Tom Hansen at the NCAA said, after you do that, call them all and make sure they got the package. Again, remember, no email. This was in a, in a package, stamp on it. And so he said, call to make sure they all have them. So I started through, and each one of them would say, oh, yeah, thanks. Uh, the one that I remember, though, is Daryl Royal. And I called, and he came on the phone. <laughs> I said, Coach Royal, did you get that package I sent to you? Yep. Any questions? Nope. Bye. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> that, was not, that was not destined to be, I didn't think, uh, a good sign for what we were doing. So we went back to that Marriott Hotel in Kansas City, had another meeting. We were talking, and apparently the committee, of course, had spoken. And so it was my turn to continue my pitch to see if I could get these folks to do something. And in the back of the room, I saw the door open, and Walter Byers stepped in the door and took a seat in the back row, back of the room. First time he'd, first time he'd shown up on any of these, and, and we've been there now like a half dozen times. And so I'm, I'm getting desperate now. This is my final pitch. We're down to there are only two people. They, they didn't understand the other people were going to be one of our customers, uh, one of the local cable systems. But they thought the two of them were equal. But anyway, this is it. I've got to make something happen. And I, I said, uh, I was doing all these things. And suddenly, Mr. Byers stands up in the back of the room. And I, I'm figuring we're making progress. He's at least in the room, right? And he stands up and he said, how do you know, how do I know you're not just looking at all of this and trying to get a commitment from us to go on a fishing expedition and find some money and do something? Whoa, that one kind of slowed me down. However, not for long, about a second. And I said, I'll tell you what, to prove that it's not a fishing expedition, you tell us and give us the information for your bank and whatever contract we agree to, we'll put 50% of the total contract price in your account on July 1st this year. Needless to say, the room was silent. I had two people with me who were about the shade of white as that piece of paper right in front of you. And uh, everybody said, okay, fine, meeting over. I looked at these two recovering assistants over here. <laughs> and uh, one was speechless, the other one said, how can you tell them that? You don't have a million whatever we're going to agree to. I said, it's only January. We've got until July to get it. <laughs> oh, I said, okay. So apparently that made an impression because this was, I remember it very specifically. That was January 5th, 20, tw January 25th. And his assistant <laughs> that I had known for years came around and came through a side door and said, Mr. Byers would like you to come to the office this afternoon. Can you schedule that? Is that okay? If I had three planes to catch, I would still be at the office that afternoon. So I went and met with him. That was January 25th. We talked a lot. He said, uh, this is something that we're going to bring to the board, and we're going to do this, and we're going to bring to the convention. And can you come back next week, 1st of, 1st of February? And I said, yeah, we can do that. What are we going to talk about? Because I wanted to get some. He said, well, I think you ought to bring your attorney with you. Whoa, that's pretty good. I, I guess we've broken through. We're going to bring our attorney and we're going to talk about some things. Little did I know that, uh, I get, can I say this in Philadelphia? <laughs> Little did I know that the King of Prussia folks had a Philadelphia lawyer. You know the old jokes about Philadelphia lawyers. Well, you might not, but Walter Byers did. And when we were introducing everybody, our friend from King of Prussia introduced the attorney that we brought along. And Byers, ex-Marine, really tough, really just, oh, man, really <coughs> tough guy, said, a Philadelphia lawyer, huh? 
Hmm. All right. Well, we better bring our lawyer in then and protect ourselves. I don't know what that meant because I've never had a Philadelphia lawyer, but that's okay. So that was on February 1st. We talked. They set out. They set out some points, and I thought, this is going pretty fast. What are we doing? This is. We're not going to have the money to pay these guys. Now, I was starting to get a little worried about it. <coughs> so we went back on February 7th. And I said, we're going to the Texas Cable Show tomorrow, February 8th, and we would like to announce that we have a deal with the National Collegiate Athletic Association to provide programming like it's never been provided to, before to all the fans of all the colleges and so on. And Walter Byers, uh, he was sitting here at the head of the table, and I was sitting right here, and he looked over and he said, you bring your checkbook? I said, even if I did, it wouldn't make any difference. There's no money in there. Well, my wife, <coughs> friends who had faded white before, faded white again, because now I've admitted that we don't have any money. So the next thing, I said, you know, we could uh, really, can we say something tomorrow at the cable convention that we're kind of talking and we have a general agreement? He said, do you have, uh, yeah, he said, we can do that. He said, that's about, um, hmm, and he was doing, he literally, he's kind of like, that's about a $100,000 request. Do you have your checkbook for that? I said, no. Nope. Same answer as before. <sighs> he, said, he took this big sign. Well, he said, I suppose we could scribble a little something out for you. <clears throat> the next day, later that day, he gave it to us. And the next day, we went to, to San Antonio, Texas, to the Texas Cable Show with an official press release from the NCAA and NCAA stationery saying that they were going to do this deal. And we announced it in... San Antonio, and everybody kind of had this blank stare. What do you mean? What's all of this? This was a big convention, and a lot of people hadn't heard about us. And the only thing that I remember is after my little five minute, we're going to give you the world, we're going to do all of this, and we're you know, on and on and on. A gentleman came up to me on the way out, and he's scratching his head, and he said, I can't imitate the Oklahoma accent, but believe me, he had one. <laughs> And he said, if y'all can do half of what you just said, this is going to be the most successful network in history. Whew. Pretty prophetic, wouldn't you say? Wow. Never saw him again, and I assume he became a customer because everybody's a customer now. <laughs> <laughs> but we had uh, really interesting negotiations, and on March 1st, we signed a contract. And that completed the cycle from when we began the whole idea to the time that we said this is really going to work. Now, unfortunately for us, we didn't have a building to put it in because we hadn't bought a lot just quite yet. Uh, we did finally uh, buy a piece of land from the, Brit from the uh, new Bristol <coughs> Redevelopment Association. Do you know what a redevelopment project really is when they sell that land? Some of you young people might have idea. Certainly some of the people who've heard this before certainly know. That's when an area has been designated as a dump. It gets full. They level off, plant grass on top, and start selling the land as a redevelopment area. The only good thing about it is it's really cheap land usually. So ESPN was founded on a piece of land that cost us $18,000. And we put up our one building on that piece of land. And today they have nearly 200 acres. We had our two satellite dishes out front. Today they have hundreds on the hillside in Southington, Connecticut. And it's uh, grown from originally our first Christmas in 1978. We had two tables of four at the local Holiday Inn dining room. That was our Christmas party. <laughs> the following Christmas we had 80 employees. We went on the air with 80 employees. And we had to take the Holiday Inn ballroom because everybody brought you know, the whole 80 employees and the rest of their fans. When we went on the air, however, <coughs> it really did change what people were thinking. We had incredible press because it was so unusual. Nobody had done it. And unknown to the networks and their, their entire community, those big three networks, ABC, NBC, and CBS, controlled TV Guide. They controlled Nielsen. They controlled a lot of things because they were those companies' biggest customers. We went to TV Guide, for example. Here's an interesting business no-no. We went to TV Guide, said, why won't you list us? Why won't you list our programming? You know what the answer was? From a vice president, 
TV guy was located right near here, by the way. Vice President said, we can't list you because real networks only have three letters. <laughs> that works only. What kind of a business decision is that? Here's a paying customer. Well, we've got too many letters. Well, we kept, we were persistent. They eventually did list us. And you know how they listed us? ESN. Three letters. They never gave up, but they conceded that we were a network, at least, so they, they put us in. But getting to that point where we were able to talk to other advertisers, the cable industry finally took to us after we did the uh, March Madness in 1980, in March of 1980, that was our first basketball after we'd gone on the air. We did every single game that the network had never done. We did the games, we taped the games, we replayed them. Some games I think might have been up there three or four times. But people wanted to watch basketball. And we started in September of 1979 with 1 1.4 million subscribers and the following September alone, now Ted Turner, Ted Turner had gotten up to about three and a half million subscribers with his super station, which was only on 18 hours a day at that point. The following September, and it had taken him a couple of years to get up to that 3.4 million. We started at 1.4, we said we've got to catch Turner, we've got to catch Turner, that's all. He and I spoke many times at different places. We traveled a lot together selling news and sports and movies and all of those things. The following September, September 1980, ESPN added 5.5 million subscribers in one month. Oh, cable trades went crazy. This is just an amazing thing that these folks have done. Um, and we knew we were on our way and have never looked back. We passed Turner then and ESPN has been number one for 30 years and probably will be for long after I'm gone and maybe long after all of us are gone. But it was uh, a rather, uh, rather amazing journey and as we came up to going on the air that night, the excitement was tempered a bit because one of the maintenance men, we were 30 minutes before going on the air, and he was wiping down the glass, and people are scurrying around, production assistants running in and out and so on. And uh, somebody asked him when he was going to finish, and he said, when I get done. He said, well, we're going on the air. He said, I don't really care. He said, I'm supposed to do this. I'm going to clean it all up. So he did that. We didn't have a control room that worked, but we didn't tell anybody that because we had a remote truck parked out around the back of the truck. We actually, ESPN actually went on the air for about the first 30 days from a remote truck, uh, which was pretty interesting. <laughs> One of the more interesting pieces was as we had the president of the NCAA, the president of the, of the chairman of the TV committee, the vice president from Anheuser-Busch's advertising agency, executives from Getty Oil, uh, all in our little control room because where do you go to watch a show get launched? You go to the control room, right? Got all kinds of dials and monitors and this and that, none of which work because none of them were hooked up. <laughs> well, we were all standing there and, and one of our guys, kind of as a practical joke, actually brought what he called a technical director, but the guy didn't, he wouldn't, if it had been working, he wouldn't have known what to do with it. But he sat there at these machines like he knew what he was doing <laughs> and nobody, he wasn't doing anything. <laughs> And so we went in and we got to our first program and the announcer said, and now ESPN's first presentation of live television, this is a sample of what we're going to have and it goes through this whole thing. And it's the World <coughs> Pitch Softball Championship World Series from Louisville, Kentucky. <laughs> Did you happen to catch that this year? I didn't. I, so, so he, then he went on and said, and now... <coughs> Here's whoever, you know, here's Charlie in Louisville. Charlie, take it away. And so he comes on and says, good evening and welcome to the mm -hmm -hmm championship series from such and such stadium here in Louisville, Kentucky, tonight featuring the Kentucky Bourbons and the Milwaukee Schlitz, brought to you by Budweiser. <laughs> know who's standing right here? Guy from Budweiser. <laughs> who had just spent $1,380,000 for exclusivity, <coughs> one year exclusivity. Little business uh, disruption there for about 30 seconds and he looked at me and he just shook his head and I said, why didn't the Bud team win? You know, I mean, what can you say? It's just the way it is, you have to, have to go. So we had, we had a, lot of, a lot of fun with those kinds of things. Uh, there are countless, countless stories about the construction of, of the buildings, um, 
<laughs> guys falling down in the mud with a stack of tapes, uh, directors tripping and falling. I mean, it was it's just, it's crazy. It's amazing that it all got on the air, but it really did. And uh, one, of the, one of the most amazing things to me when I look back is nobody, nobody hesitated from the very beginning. We went on the air the very first night and said, this is it. This is where, this is sports headquarters. From here on out, this is where you're going to, who didn't even know where Bristol, Connecticut was. And we're telling them it's now the world, sports capital, the sports capital of the world. And um, it turned out to be a, a pretty good one. And today, for some of you who think about what other involvement ESPN might have, they are very, very involved in the city of Bristol. They, they have uh, helped create parks, and, and some of you, I'm sure, have seen these really, what I consider a really great commercial for sports center. Roger Clemens throwing somebody through the front window, or Jorge Posada walking along, or Grant Hill playing basketball. You know what those guys do when they go up to Bristol to do that? They go down to local parks, and the kids are down there. And I remember the first one that I heard of was Grant Hill and a couple of his buddies were there, basketball players, pretty high-level basketball players. And some kids were playing on the court, and they went down, just stood on the side like they would have in their own days when they were in high school, and said, you know, next in, and so on. And the guy said, yeah, yeah. And they looked over and recognized who it was. You know, and of course, they got in, and these kids, they played with the kids. And uh, obviously, they had a lot of fun. Grant Hill and his buddies had a lot of fun. But I've often wondered, when those kids went home at night, how many do you think, how many of their parents do you think really believed them when they say, hey, Played a few rounds with Grant Hill down at the ballpark, uh, down at the court today. <laughs> oh, yeah, right, okay. <laughs> no, really, he was here for ESPN. Yeah, he was here. He was here. <laughs> I'm sure some parents still, still don't believe it to, to this day. But it was, a, it was an amazing time, and it really, really all started. We're going to get some questions here shortly as we get into the question time. But I wanted to, uh, for those of you who might not have seen it, it is someplace on YouTube. You can go find it, and some of you... I may have already seen it, but from the very instant we went on the air, we declared that we were, this was it. And Lee Leonard, an announcer from North Jersey who had worked at NBC, came up and delivered the first opening lines, and those opening lines really have been etched in my mind for a long time, as you might imagine. If you're a fan, if you're a fan, what you'll see in the next minutes, hours, and days to follow may convince you you've gone to sports heaven. Beyond that blue horizon lies a limitless world of sport, and right now, you're standing on the edge of tomorrow. Sports, 24 hours a day from ESPN, the Total Sports Cable Network. Wow. We, sat, we just sat there and told these people, and we're one minute in our life, and we're telling everybody, you come here, this is where it's going to be, baby. We got it right here. We have had it there ever since. So... It's been an amazing adventure for me. I've had the absolute delightful opportunity to speak to groups like you all across the country, from Los Angeles to Virginia to Maine and all the places in between. And uh, I guess the thing that I have to say to every single one of you is thank you for all being ESPN fans. Some questions? Okay. Any questions? Look at that. We can go home early. No, no. <laughs> Sir, you guys come up with the uh, concept for Sports Center, like to go through like an hourly roll of highlights. The uh, Sports Center, I had done a half-hour sports show in Hartford on a local station, in 1975. That a local station couldn't support a full half-hour show, but that idea was kind of in in my head. And when we were driving on that fateful day in October, from the I mean in August, from the uh, from Connecticut down to in a traffic jam down to New Jersey and back, talking about what we're going to put on, what we're going to put on. I said, you know, we ought to do this half-hour sports show, and we'll call it. Let's see, uh, you know, and this is two guys driving. We'll call it uh, Sports Central. Sounded good. By the time we got on the air, it was Sports Center. Uh, <coughs> when we took that idea to the cable industry, they said, sports and television suicide. You're not going to put it on at 6.30 opposite ABC, NBC, and CBS Evening News. And we said, why not? Well, because they've got 93% of the audience who's going to watch you. We said, well, if one watches and they tell another one, then we've got two, and then we've got four, and then we've got 16. I can only go to 64. I'm not. Oh, 128. <laughs> uh, and in that, 
at that time, and we said, yeah, we're going we're gonna to do it, and we did. We started right off with it, and it is now, today, there have been more episodes of SportsCenter aired than any other program in the history of television. And their viewership on a monthly basis is 100 million households. So it went from one to two to four to 16 and on up to 100 million. But it was just, uh, I had been a sportscaster, and you get three and a half minutes of real time, and there's just no way you can get all that sports news in. So now ESPN, I think maybe one of you, I don't really know, I think they do like, is it 16 hours live or 12 hours live, something like that. They just keep going, it's, it's amazing. Sir? Uh, well, when did you first launch ESPN News uh, Well, that's an interesting question because one of the knocks that everybody was trying to tell us 24-hour sports will never work. Who's going to watch sports? Now you're going to have saturation. It's too much sports. And I believe it was, I'm going to say 1990, early 90s, ESPN2 came along. Oh, now you've really done it. Too much sports. Saturation. Who's going to watch? We've got regional sports networks. We've got team sports networks. And now you're going to try and do another 24 hours? Fast forward to today, ESPN now has 52 networks 24 hours a day around the world. 52, and people want more. It's just amazing. The, uh, I don't think sports fans, I don't think there is a saturation level. Some fans want basketball, some fans want lacrosse, some hockey, rugby, name whatever it is, but, and then Sports Center and shows like Baseball Tonight and the NFL on Sunday morning, those are just tremendous audience builders. So. I don't know if there is a saturation point. It's uh, Fox, Fox Sports is out there, Comcast Sports, the regional sports networks get big, bigger, and ESPN is forever looking to do more and to do better. The, uh, the characters at ESPN, 40 people that started with us in that first year are still there. 40 people. We only had 80 when we started. So when you start thinking about experience and ideas, I have to tell you, I have to tell you one, do we have any lawyers in the room? Anybody planning to study law? Here's your, okay. Don't ever sue ESPN because they'll win. <laughs> <laughs> Today they have the money to win. Back then, when we started, the, I, the rule for um, public domain of any game or any TV clip, I believe was 22 seconds, 20 or 22 seconds which means that I could come to any TV station and take 22 seconds of a Major League Baseball game or whatever, but boy, they were really strict. It was 22 seconds. Well, CBS following, and I have to tell you, the, the, the pecking order in the networks is CBS considers themselves kind of the Tiffany. They look down at the other two networks. NBC is rich because of RCA, and ABC, of course, belongs to ESPN now, so go figure that. But, but uh, CBS in that day did not want us to be carrying their highlights, even though by law we could put them up. So they naturally threatened to sue us. Isn't that, isn't that what's great about America? You don't like it, sue somebody. Well, we didn't want a lawsuit, obviously, but what are we gonna do? We weren't gonna start <coughs> carrying the clips. We had a production man who was very inventive, and this, is, this doesn't come from classes or studying or whatever, it comes from ingenuity. It comes from knowing all of the players. He went out and hired six college kids, put a bright red ESPN jacket on them, and on the back was about the biggest logo you could find in white letters, ESPN. And he said, where is CBS televising this week? They were televising it wherever it might have been. And the instructions for these six kids were to take a paper clip, I mean a, a notepad and it'd go along the sideline. His instructions were stay on the side where the cameras are, never take your eyes off the field, and have at least one of you in the defensive backfield roughly looking in and one of them over here looking at the offense and somebody always, always, always on the line of scrimmage and just kind of float up and down the side of the field with the play. Well, oh, Monday the phone rang CBS, you can't do that. You can't do that to us because you know what that did? CBS had ESPN in every single second that they were on the air. <laughs> they were promoting us. 
So they called them. Now they were really going to sue us. They said, you can't do that. They said, well, the rule and, and Jim can tell you if you have press credentials and you have sideline passes and whatever credentials you have, then we had enough clout at that point at least, to get those sideline passes. So CBS was just furious. And they were drawing the papers. We're, we're, we're going to, we're going to, is that what you do? I don't know. You draw, you, whatever you do, preparing the documents. <laughs> so we did it the following Saturday. Monday morning, we get a call and they said, well, you know, maybe that public domain rule is okay and you can go ahead and do it and we're not going to talk to you about suing you anymore. We, we got the message. We had two full games of CBS just promoting the life out of ESPN. And it was great. So there's more than a legal solution to, to some things. That was kind of fun. The other question. <coughs> Sir. Um, with the, you guys recently buying the network in Texas and the websites popping up like ESPN New York and ESPN Boston, um, is ESPN going to be localizing? Is that something that's going to continue? Yep, they're going to, they'll have what they tell me is that they will have the ability to have those ESPN New York, Boston, Chicago, Dallas, and so on. I'm not sure how, how deep they're going to go into the big cities, but um, George Bodenheim, the president, said I wake up every day thinking defense and looking for better ideas to distribute the, the sports news to fans as they, locally as well as nationally. So they will, they will keep doing that, and uh, they will keep being very, very innovative. They are not at all afraid to try anything new. Uh, you, you folks probably know a lot better than I do. I'm, they tell me I have a Facebook page, and I don't even know what that means. Does that sense? <laughs> so, and what's this Twitter thing going around? Anybody know about that? <clears throat> but anyway, I, a little bit of kidding there. I know a little bit about that. But, but if you think back to the progression of TV, it's been, it was free to air, and then it was cable, and then it was, um, well, HDTV came in, and the internet, and so on, and now the next iteration, I'm told, because I don't know very much about any of that stuff from a technical point of view, is IPTV, does that ring a bell with any of you? Internet Protocol <coughs> TV, which is direct, basically your campus here could be a TV station, and you can broadcast to your own specific slice of the world. Um, as I say, I'm not a technical person. I don't know exactly how that works, but they just keep innovating. And part of that is look into the cities, <coughs> look into sports. People are looking at rugby and uh, lacrosse and other sports. And there's a great move to go down to the high school level. And uh, you might not remember, let's see, 11 years ago at do you, do you remember Y2K? Does that ring a bell with any of you? <laughs> is that, yeah, back then, this was really going to be a bad thing. But anyway, <coughs> the uh, Wall Street Journal had an article on either January 1st or December 31st talking about what all has happened in the 20th century as we've come forward and all the development. And, they, and, and I remember one of the lines that they said was, we have reached the point where every athlete with a number on his back has a camera following him around all over the world. And we're also soon all going to be watching that. And it's almost coming, it's coming to that. It's amazing how, you know, high school kids, they're down, uh, what's it, USC? That just signed a seventh or an eighth grade quarterback or something. It was, I mean, this is crazy, but it happens. Another question. Yes. Uh, what is your level of involvement? I'm, I'm sorry? Your level of involvement with the company? I, I'm sorry. Yeah. What is your level of involvement with the company? Oh. I get the good fortune of going around talking to it and they can't fire me. <laughs> Every time. Uh, everybody that started ESPN, including Getty, in 1984, June 25th, 1984, Texaco bought everything. Uh, then Texaco spun off the network and, and when they bought it, everybody was, all the original uh, people were out. Uh, ABC then bought the, from the ESPN from Texaco. Cap Cities bought ABC, and then Disney bought all of them in 1993 or four. And today, the biggest single profit item to Disney's bottom line is ESPN. They make, they, uh, I don't have the exact number, but it was something like 
five billion dollars after taxes, interest, and depreciation last year. That's that's a pretty big number from starting at two point four cents per subscriber. Sir, uh, when was the first time you decided to try to put a? a oh, we I I had talked to Pete Rosell in uh, the summer of nineteen seventy nine before we even went on the air, because obviously. The NFL, Major League Baseball, and so on, uh, were, were, were going to be key in, in the future years. And Roselle was a uh, was the commissioner of the National Football League at that time. Very respectful, very interested, and uh, I was mentioning just earlier today, I remember his words very plainly. He said, not today, Bill, but some someday. And he uh, came through and within... I think it was eight years later, we split a package of Monday night. They wanted to experiment with uh, TNT and ESPN. We each got a half season. And then the following year, ESPN got the contract. And the most amazing thing to me is hearing Monday night football on ESPN. That was been a, had been an ABC property all of my life. All of my NFL Monday night football life with Dandy Don Meredith and Howard Cosell and Frank Gifford and so on, and uh, four years ago when it came on and I heard that first, da 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 wow, Monday Night Football on ESPN. And we were showing Australian rules football just 30 years ago, <coughs> some Canadian football and little, you know, little this and a little that. But uh, I think all of the sports, I think Baseball Tonight has done amazing things to build a Major League Baseball audience, and uh, the NFL says they've just had their most successful year. So each... And, and the college sports, each of the, each of the conferences, the uh, Big East Conference, uh, the SEC has signed an amazing uh, contract with ESPN and CBS Sports. What surprises me today, and maybe some of you are going to be the people who are going to be inventing these kinds of things, some of the big contracts today that have been signed through 2025, <coughs> I don't know the, the legal term <coughs> if I was a lawyer, but basically what they say is, we own all of your rights. Okay? We own your TV and your radio and your internet and your this and that. And then they have, and this is clearly not going to be stated the way they do it legally, we have the right to all of your content distributed over any technology that has not yet been invented. How is that for being powerful? In other words, they're saying, if you think of something new in 2018, since our contract goes to 2025, we own those rights. Whoa, that, that, that's a pretty powerful contract. So we'll, we'll see where that goes. Yes? Um, after Larry Bird and Magic Johnson helped you define uh, the uh, tournament in 79, how much of a factor would you say that the further development of March Madness had on ESPN in the early and mid 80s? There's a, an, it's interesting that you say it that way. That game that you refer to, which obviously we're all aware of, has grown in stature in the years, literally. It was another game, and I mean, Michigan State, Indiana State, wow. It's gonna be a blowout, but because of Bird and, and Johnson. But it has gained in stature because <coughs> of the careers that Johnson and Bird had in the NBA. ESPN started, I, I remember going to the Final Four in uh, 1980, I guess, 1979. It was 79. Didn't sell out. It was in, in Indianapolis. They, they didn't sell out. Um, today, they hold lotteries for tickets for the Final Four. They sell them a year in advance, and the prices have gone up. It's, it's an interesting combination, you know, chicken and the egg. ESPN started promoting it. I remember Walter Byers, if you remember, I was saying we were sitting there and talking about doing all these games, and he said, <laughs> you mean to tell me that if uh, in the tournament, would you televise it? Yep, sure would. We're going to televise them all. Every game? Yep, every game. That's what we're going to pay you for. Okay, you know what? In that year, 1979-80 season at the end in March, man, those two schools did play. And standing here before you today, I have no idea whether he rigged it or it was just, <laughs> <laughs> just to find out if we were going to do it. But uh, uh, I think the the... The growing mystique about the Bird Johnson game and that March Madness, I think that helped explode all of college basketball. And 
doesn't make any difference who takes credit for it. It's it's just been wonderful for everyone. Yes, sir. Yes, um, ma'am, sir. I can't see back there. Hi. A yeah. common criticism of Sports Center is yep. the kind of Brett Favre syndrome. I know first five minutes is has he retired or not? Kind of repeating those stories. Is there anything ESPN does to try and avoid, you know, repeating the same story quite so much? Or? The only thing that helps them avoid repeating the same story is to have more and more sports events happening, and I think they <coughs> they keep inventing some new things. But uh, their theory is, some of you may remember in the early days of CNN, and I don't know how long they did it, but they started another network, and they, they went down the theory that give us 22 minutes, their saying was, give us 22 minutes, we'll give you the world. And they basically repeated that same, 22, 22 on the theory that not every person watches anywhere near as avidly as people watch sports center people get addicted to sports center and you watch hours of it and so you you see some some things come around uh i i think that they the producers all have a sense of what is happening and what's new and what's breaking and as soon as the newest greatest thing happens or the greatest highlight comes along they come forward and and away we go but i I think the uh, going now to more live sports centers should start to eliminate some of that, but, but who knows? And, and a, a lot of it depends on the individual producers. But if they get too much in a rut, they won't be working there very long. They just, they just demand high standards of all of the people working there. Any other question? Yes, sir. Hypothetically, if the NFL doesn't reach a new agreement, it's interesting. I just read today that the the rights fees. Maybe you've read the same thing. The rights fees will be paid to the NFL. That's in the contract. Whether they play or not, they pay. So it's it's not play for pay. It's play uh, pay regardless of the play, uh, which I think is a great contract for the NFL. Um, my guess is that they would either do something else with the college the college game they would uh, if Chris Berman and those guys aren't doing the Sunday morning it'd probably be Chris Fowler and his crew doing a recap of the preceding Saturday and uh, I don't know what they would pick to run but they've got they've got so much that reminds me and uh, to give you a little idea about today everybody's a very aware you're aware of contracts and all of these things when we started, we were able to, the NCAA had a rule where we could tape a game and play it <coughs> after 10.30 at night Eastern time. So the first season we did all of those, we taped games and so on. And in our early st stages, we had a lot of young assistants and one of them would be assigned and we'd uh, record the game in four, on four tapes, four reels of tape, not digital and all this stuff, but literal tape. And they would say, okay, and now it's 7.30 or 10.30, whatever it was. Here's USC and UCLA. Real one, real two, you know, come to the end, put a commercial in, play the next one. It's halftime, play a commercial, came back, and the guy put up the fourth quarter, coming out of half, and said, now what am I gonna do? I can just imagine his feeling, his, you know, huh, hmm. <coughs> Anyway, nothing happened. So the fourth quarter ended, and he said, well, I better play the third quarter. Put the third quarter up. <laughs> had to fill the time, right? So we put the third quarter up, Game ended, went on. The phone never rang through the entire, we didn't have anybody watching. <laughs> it's the only thing, well, only thing we can include, nobody watched that game. Or maybe it was a bad game anyway and they didn't care, I don't know. But today that would never happen. They would get about three seconds in and the emails would be killing them. Any other questions? Yes, sir. I'm sorry, oh, do you guys see yourselves establishing a relationship with the NHL on a contract with Gary Bevin or is that Oh, let me tell you, I personally, being involved in the hockey business for a number of years, when we went on the air, we had a deal with um, the Whalers and the Washington Capitals right from the get-go, 1979. That grew into a contract with the National Hockey League that was three years for $20 million. Rights fees weren't as big back then. $20 million is a big number, though, but three years. At the end of that, which would have been 1984-ish, uh, there was something that was starting called Fox Sportsnet. It's not the same Fox Sports that you see today in the regions, but Fox Sportsnet. 
they said, they went to the NFL and said, we'll pay you $51, $51 million for a three-year contract. The NHL jumped instantly, and ESPN took Hockey Tonight off the air, and the Fox had no audience. Their audience went right in the tank. So at the end of that three-year period, which was in the late 80s, they came back to ESPN and said, we'd like you to bid on our, <coughs> bid on our package, another three-year contract. You know, we just finished the contract for $51 million, so the bidding is going to open at, and before they got any farther than that, ESPN said, at $20 million. But, 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 no. You want the audience, you want the $20 million, or do you want somebody else to pay you $51 million for nobody to watch? So ESPN got back in it again. And that has, it's, it's just been a really weird relationship. Uh, the National Hockey League, when I was doing things with them back in the 70s, even in the uh, late 60s, when it was really just kind of getting into network television, <coughs> for some reason the National Hockey League has just had a difficult time selling the sport because the puck moves too fast. And negotiating contracts, they have been number four out of four of the major of the four major sports. Don't know why, but eventually it'll come. It seems it comes back every time they get burned. They come back to ESPN. Any other question? Sir? What was like one thing that you did during the founding of ESPN where you look back and you say, if I was not able to accomplish this, if I didn't do this, ESPN would have floundered. <coughs> I guess uh, there were one of five things. Because without, without the money, it wouldn't have worked. Without the customers, it wouldn't have worked. Without the advertising, it wouldn't have worked. Without the satellite, it certainly couldn't have worked. Um, and I, I guess, though, I mean, you knew the customers would be there if you could get the programming, is the way I felt. And really, the programming was the, the foundation of it all, and that was the NCAA. Breaking through the NCAA barrier and getting them to understand what we were trying to do and getting them to sign on. And the NCAA in those days had such prestige. We were, we were little guys, and here was a big, very visible company, not company, entity, NCAA saying, yes, this is a good idea, and we're in, but basically they endorsed us. They agreed to do some business. So if I had to pick one thing, I guess it would be the NCAA programming, and then going down from that, the first NCAA uh, March Madness. So the NCAA was, was critical. Without that, we couldn't have found it enough programming to fill, you know, half that time. Sir? Yeah, before when you answered the question about the... Uh Larry Bird and Magic Johnson game. You said something about the explosion of college basketball. Would you consider ESPN to be like the explosion of sports, like creating a sports revolution? Yeah, I think so. I uh, other people have tried it, uh, but nobody got anywhere near as far along as quickly as ESPN did. <coughs> and it soon became evident that players wanted to be seen on Sports Center, and then they wanted to be in the top ten. And I think that some of them must keep, they must have somebody keep track of them and how many big 10, uh, top 10 appearances they get affects the next contract negotiation or something, I don't know. I remember, uh, it, it seems very short to me, but free agency in baseball, for example, has only been around since the 1970s. And Marvin Miller got that thing started when people playing in the World Series would make almost no money at all and have to work in the summertime, in the wintertime. And now the Major League Baseball salaries are like, average is three plus million dollars. And there was a stretch when, when salaries began exploding, where I actually, and I had already left ESPN by that time. I was technically there, but not working every day. Um, people would call me and say that it's my fault that salaries are going up. Like I, you know, like I had something to do with that. And then I'd say, you know, no, no. And then they, well, it's really ESPN's fault because players now have so much more to talk about and there's so much the egos grow and their payrolls grow and the agents are taking advantage of it so yeah I, I, the explosion I, I explosion of sports explosion of salaries and also explosion of audiences more and more people go to games today than ever before which is really a, kind of a paradox when we first began talking about television at the local level television sports at the local level in the 1960s and even into the mid-80s, the knee-jerk reaction from big schools and professional teams was, 
if we televise the game, nobody's going to come to the game. And I would, my answer was, if you televise the game, you're selling your product, and more people are going to come to the game. And it wasn't just little guys. I remember the University of Michigan, Don Cannon was their athletic director, considered the guru of college marketing, and he was adamant. You can have three games, and I know I'm going to take a hit in my attendance and so on, but it'll probably help in the long run. I think Michigan is sold out now for, um, I don't know, 422 straight games or some such thing. Over 30 years, I don't think they've had an empty seat in the house. But there was a, a strong feeling among a lot of people that to televise a game was to hurt the sport. But when ESPN came along, turned around, and now I think everybody clamors for television. Yes, ma'am? What you're talking about right now is, is pretty interesting. Villanova right now is, is our board of trustees and president are discussing how they're going to pursue this through the NCAA tournament. Do you think that that's something that could be taken seriously for Villanova to really look at and think about in terms of making that decision? Money. <laughs> They get paid a lot of money. The, uh, the conference splits on ESPN televised contracts and so on is, is very, very lucrative. But also, people all over the country are going to see Villanova. It's going to be, I remember Jim Beheim uh, early on when the ESPN got going was talking about uh, how wonderful it is now to cut into John Wooden's recruiting hometown, home backyard. Because until ESPN came along, Californians would recruit in California and New York, you know, and so on. And so you get the visibility and you'll get recruits from all over the country. You'll get students from all over the country because you get to tell your story, your own story in those games. Speaking of stories, can't do this without a commercial, right? <laughs> <laughs> and now we'll take time out for now. We'll be back after. This, uh, this is a paperback version that you can find on my website, ESPNfounder.com. Uh, just today, it's also out in Kindle. Probably a lot better if you didn't carry it around a old pile of paper, right? Uh, it's it's all a lot of the things. It's all of the things that we talked about here today, plus a lot more uh, up leading up to the launch of ESPN. Uh, Sports junkies rejoice! I got to look to make sure. No, I don't. Have <coughs> Sports junkies rejoice! The birth of ESPN, and uh, it's a fun read. And you can ask. And, and today, you can ask a lot of people. <coughs> a lot of trivia contests because not many people remember those days. Your parents might, though. You might test them. Anyway, our, that's the end of our questions. As, um, I would like to say, uh, as chairperson of the communication department, I was very pleased to be able to join with my colleagues in the School of Business and Villanova Athletics to welcome you to campus, Mr. Rasmus. Thank you. Thank you very much. sort of bring to light three things that are passions at Villanova, and that would be sports, entrepreneurship, and also broadcast sports, um, but also because I think your story encapsulates something that we at Villanova really emphasize, which is that one individual actually does have the power to change the world. So thank you for sharing your story. Thank you. Thank you.